We will now hear about the data in time and infant statistical learning, the multi-scale structure of everyday experience. And here to tell us about this is Distinguished Professor of Indiana University in Bloomington, USA. Please welcome Linda Smith. Um, as is always the case, I changed my title at the last minute. Um, I am very happy um, to be here, delighted actually to be here. Um, I actually came to Lund at the front end of this 10-year um, organization, um, intellectually interesting event. So, all right, the data in developmental time. So perhaps one of the most fundamental questions and all of psychology is the role of the environment. Why are the way we are? What is essential to our experiences that makes us the way that we are? What are the malleable points in development? And what are the mechanisms of change? And historically, the classic debate has put answers to the questions of why we are the way we are and what are the malleable points for change and learning either inside the infant, the structure of the baby, or in the structure of the world. In the 21st century, we know that it is a much more complex interaction than that. But what is the nature of that interaction? That's what I want to talk about today. And I'm going to tell you about things we have been learning that I think challenge many of our current understandings. And that work has been uh, focused on the question of what is the data for infant visual learning. And what we have been doing here is putting head cameras and head-mounted eye trackers on babies as they go about everyday sorts of experiences, trying to understand what the data for learning, what the structure is of experience from their perspective. We have um, three basic kind of structures in which we do this. One is what we call the multi-sensory project. This is where we bring infants and often their parents into the laboratory and we wire them up with head-mounted eye trackers and motion sensors. It's high resolution, free-flowing, but maybe not quite as naturalistic as one might think because they're wired up. The middle level is what we call the toy room. That's in the lab. Um, here we also have um, babies with uh, head-mounted eye trackers on but they're well fit to their heads and they're free to move about a kind of home-like space with toys and things to do. And then we have the third data set in which we embed um, head cameras in small hats and they record on SD cameras and we send them on SD cards and we send them home with parents and try to get six to eight hours of head camera, the world from the infant's view um, at home with no experimenters present. Now, why do we do this? Because our experience, our visual experience of the world isn't of all the things that are available. It's literally only what's right in front of our face. Okay? So if I am standing looking here, I might know there's a bowl of fruit over there, but I can't see it. It is not in my direct experience. Okay? It might be quite near to me, but it is not part of my sensory input. And so as you can illus as illustrated here, if we have this baby sitting in a high chair being fed by a person, at this moment in time, the dog behind the baby, the woman at the sink, the clock on the wall, the dad loading the washing machine, they are not in this baby's experience. Now you could think to yourself, oh, the baby could turn around, the baby could look, the baby could move, but if the baby is biased, in terms of what they like to look at, if the baby's biased or restrained in terms of their sensory motor abilities and what they can do, then they have a very biased input that depends very much on where they are and what they're doing at the moment. And only that, only the data received by the sensors is the data for learning, not what's around you. I'm going to mostly today talk about the content of head camera images and many people who spent their lives doing eye tracking in the laboratory think, how can you just use the head camera image without the eye tracking? Because babies' eyes glance about. If you're sitting and looking at screens, that is correct. 
But if you're out in the world, if you're a two-month-old baby, a six-month-old baby, a 12-year-old, if you are you, if you're out walking in the world, you look at the world with your head and eyes aligned. So it's another example. If I'm staring right at you, maybe in my periphery is the water over there. I can barely see it, but I can't really see it. If I'm going to look at it, I've got to turn my head. <coughs> I'm going to be talking about data in head camera images where I've got 60,000, hundred thousands of images. The delay between if I really attend to something with my heads and eyes aligned here, looking and moving is about 500 milliseconds. And 100,000 images, what's mostly in the center of the image is mostly what's being looked at. These are data from uh, head-mounted eye trackers that show you in all kinds of activities, toddlers, but this is true for you, it's true for older children, it's true for younger babies as well, tend to fixate when they're moving about, not sitting in front of a screen. They look with heads and eyes aligned. What all these data tell us is that if we're going to think about the structure of the data in the environment, we can't think about the baby and the world. We have to think about how the baby moves through that world in time. It is like a journey, okay? All the data available to this baby is not there at once. They're in a particular point in that world, particular space with its properties and particular activities in time, okay? And it has ordered in time, it's not a random sampling. And so what we found out by putting head cameras on babies is that um, the statistical regularities in the environment develop as the learner develops. Each step as they move along that journey, there's a change in the structure of the data. That the data for learning at any point in time is highly selective. It's not everything that's possible. It's highly selective, constrained by space and time. And it's constrained and generated by the learner's own behavior. That brings us back to point one. As the learner's behavior changes with development, the data for learning changes markedly. And that's the first point I want to make, um, is that the statistical regularities in the environment develop as the baby develops. Babies do not start out randomly in their explanation and learning about the world. Their selection of the data is highly constrained by their sensory motor abilities, what they can do, what they do do, what they want to do. These data are going to come from what we call the HomeView Project. Um, I like to call out the National Science Foundation in the US because it was very brave when they first funded us to do this. We are building a corpus of developmentally indexed egocentric scenes. We actually now have over 101 infants. They range in age from three weeks to 24 months. We embed head cameras in hats. They record on cards, no experimenters present. Try to get four to eight, we tried to get eight hours but people's lives with children are difficult. We tend to get four to six hours. Um, we have over 54 uh, million extracted frames. That's a lot of data, so what we do is we uh, sample the data from these head camera images at one every five seconds. These just give you samples of what they look like at the different ages. It's a pretty dense sampling, but it's one every five seconds. The first thing you need to know if you were to walk away from this is the baby's view is not our view. And what I'm going to show you here is a video. This is across all the three videos that'll run simultaneously. This is maybe about 200,000 images. We have images from babies under three months here, what we call sparse that seem to be odd things with nothing in view and ordinary scenes, babies six to eight months, babies 11 to 12 months. If you look first at the under three months, you see a lot of lights and ceilings. People's faces show up a lot. If you look at babies six to eight months, you see the floor. They are crawling or falling on it. And you see sort of regular scenes, but a little weird. For the uh, 11 to 12 month old, these start maybe more looking like what you would see if you were taking pictures yourself. The spar scenes are mostly running around outdoors, and then the other scenes have quite recognizable kinds of components, okay? 
So the visual data for learning, the basic data for visual learning is changing dramatically with development. So I just want to tell you a little bit of what we know about it. One of the first studies we did looked at the frequency of faces. And on the y-axis here is the proportion of frames with faces. On the x-axis is the age in months. This was our first published study from this project. And at this point, each one of these dots is an individual baby, and each baby contributed over 3,000 images, OK? So each dot's a child. And what you can see is that the frequency of faces declines pretty dramatically in age. And I know it looks at the bottom of the graph here, so how dramatic is this? But frames are time. These babies under three months of age are seeing faces about 25% of the time, frames. That's 15 minutes out of every waking hour is a face. It's a lot of data about faces. 15 minutes out of every waking hour. By the time they're approaching their first birthday, it's down to six minutes out of every hour. To save time, I didn't put some of the details in here, but for those young babies, the faces are all within two feet, and they show both eyes. For older babies, the faces are more varied, varied kind of faces, far, not directly looking at you. Okay. Now, the one thing that's interesting, I think it's interesting, is it's faces that decline with age, not people in view. If I go and from these head camera images count any body part, is there a face in view, is there a knee in view, is there an elbow in view, is there a foot in view? Throughout the first two years of life, there are just about always people in view. Anybody who knows children would realize this has to be the case. Nobody in their right mind would leave an 18-month-old alone. You might leave a three-month alone in a crib, but you would never, ever leave an 18-month alone. People are always nearby. It's faces that are special. The faces are in view early and not so much in view later. What's in view later? So on the x-axis here, this is just a later study, a few more babies, a few more faces and other things. But on the x-axis on the top is proportion of faces, function of age, each dot's a child. Down here is the proportion of hands. And as you can see, faces, the frequency of faces in these head camera images at home decline pretty dramatically with age. And the proportion of hands goes up. This bar graph here is one I particularly like because these are just children in Bloomington, Indiana, all kinds, whose parents agreed to put head cameras on them for ideally eight hours. Most didn't give us that in a day, okay? Different homes, different activities. We told them we were interested in vision. They could do anything they wanted. But if you look at this, each bar is a child, and that's a different score between the frequency of faces and the frequency of hands in their head camera images. <coughs> and what you see across these very different families doing very different things is a systematic shift from the dominance of the faces of people to the dominance of the hands of people. These hands in these data are the hands of other people. That's all we counted in this. We were interested in other people. But it's even sharper when you include the baby's own hands. <coughs> now, the thing that's interesting about hands is, of course, the images these babies are seeing with hands are not hands floating around doing nothing. They are hands holding objects, hands doing instrumental acts. They are in. By the time you get up to an 18-month-old, so 70% of all hands are in contact with an object. By the time you get up to an 18-month-old, 80% of all images have hands in them. This is probably the most people so fancy about faces being the definition of the be-all and end-all of being human. Hands are what are always in view in the lives of children. Hands doing something all the time. All right, so that's my first little point. We, there's a lot we don't know and a lot more we need to know, but the training set for visual development for children changes dramatically over the first two years of life. A shift from a lot of faces to a lot about hands. 
There's another aspect of the young babies under three months that I want to show you as well. So I told you just before I conclude this section, 15 minutes out of every hour for young babies is faces that are close, so they have low spatial frequency. 10 minutes out of every hour for young babies under three months of age are images that look like this, okay? And these are the individual images from one baby of all the ones we call sparse. And so the repetitions of nearly similar ones are one every five seconds, gives you a sense of how long the baby was staring at these items. For any of you interested in vision, I don't know how many of you are, but that's one of our big motivations here. This looks, you'd never see this, ever, in older babies, ever, okay? These are totally unique to babies under three months of age. It really looks like they're in a Hubel and Weasel experiment, and it looks like excellent training for V1 and V2, and they are clearly biased to pull this out, okay? All right. So why is all this important, this shift in data? Okay, this is a representation, a little old now, but I like it because it shows the full complexity of the human visual system. We know that at every level of the human visual system, from V1 all the way up to IT and the recognition of fancy things like cars and houses and hands, we know that at every level is tuned and trained and sharpened by visual experience, okay? Every level of the visual system. So down here at three months, we are training every level of the visual system, V1, V2, all the way up, with massive input about these two kinds of visual experiences. This is the foundation. And later on, when this child needs to be learning about cups and hands, they're coming through a system that's already been trained by this. There's all kinds of interesting indicators about critical periods in the first three months, the work of Daphne Maurer, again, I don't have time for this talk, but we need to understand not what this is building about face recognition only, but what it's building in terms of the whole system, because it is the visual foundation, statistically, for all that comes later. All right, so now to my second point. At each point in development, the sampling is also highly selective. It looks like nothing, nothing at all, like the experiments anybody runs on learning, okay? The sampling is not normally distributed. It is not a random sample of the world. It is not a uniform sample of the world. It's highly selective because when our little baby is six months old, let's say, and hanging out with those trees, he sees a lot of those trees wherever right nearby him. He's not seeing the other variety over there, okay? Wherever he is, that's what he sees. And what this ends up with is distributions in which that are highly skewed, no matter what you look at. Very few things are sampled, very few individual things are sampled very, very frequently, and almost everything else is sampled occasionally but rarely. Everything is a right skew distribution. So if we look about the frequency of faces, so the y-axis is the proportion of frequently appearing faces, all of them. How many faces do you get if you just get the most frequent person, mom? How many faces do you get if you get the two most frequent people, mom and dad? If you get three, I could say the sibling, but I'm a grandmother, so I'll say mom, dad, and grandma, okay? Top three. Throughout the first year, the top three faces count for, in an individual child, count for just about everybody. The foundation for face perception and the foundation for being able to recognize any face is built in the first year of life over mostly seeing just a few faces. We have recently co collected data in rural India where there's no electricity and people spend most of their time outdoors. And what is conserved in that is up until about five, six months, still, top three faces account for about 80% of all faces, okay, in view, okay. It's also true for learning object categories. 
These are data we're just about getting ready to submit, but any of you who thinks about your own life, oh, by the way, you should, your views of faces are also, despite the fact you're in this room with all these people, I'm rare, okay, I'm rare in your life. The people you live with, those are the faces you see. They, they comprise probably for an adult about 75% of the faces you see. This is also true for learning object categories. So, a toddler, 12, 14 month old, what kind of cups does he see? About 85% by our estimates is that a baby is going to see 85% his own, at 18 months, his own sippy cup. If he has a substitute sippy cup, number two, the less favorite one, might be up there pretty close. Mom's coffee cup, okay, it's rare. It's there every day, okay? But his own sippy cup. And now what does he see of his sippy cup? He sees his sippy cup in good views and bad views. He sees his sippy cup up close and far away. He sees his sippy cup partially occluded upside down in the dishwasher. Most of what he knows about cups comes from extensive visual experience of a single cup, okay? This is not like anybody thinks about teaching a category. If you're gonna teach somebody the category cup, for example, if you were some machine learning expert, right, and you want computer vision to recognize cups, these would be your training stimuli. Bunch of different cups cut out from bad backgrounds, okay? That's not the data on which human visual prowess and cup recognition derives, okay? I'll just make a little more point about this by coming in on a particular developmental period, um, eight to 10 month olds. These are babies who are, um, just in case some of you aren't developmentalists, eight to 10 month olds are a really interesting age. These are babies who are working on sitting stably, on manipulating objects, on standing, and they are not good at any of it. This is the age when the baby sits and they reach for an object, they topple over, where you give them a spoon and they poke their eye out, okay? That's this age. We used to think that object name learning began at 12 months because we used to take the marker when they said their own, when they said object names. But we now know from experimental evidence that by eight months, nine months, babies have, are recognizing not a huge number of object names, but if you say a name, they will look to common objects with some reliability, okay? So that's who these babies are. Yeah. Okay, the visual system is not as mature as it should be, but the key thing is the optics are bad. The optics are bad, so they can't focus very well, and essentially it's not really that their acuity is bad, but the optics are bad. And so it, people talk about it in terms of acuity. The optics put a filter, basically, on the world which only likes um, high contrast and low spatial frequency. Okay. So crowded, dense, low contrast scenes, they may not be getting much out of anyway, which is probably why they bias the high contrast, low spatial frequency signal, okay? Um, they used to say that by six months they could see like adults, that's probably not at all true, okay? And there's a lot of interesting work on that, okay? All right, so eight to uh, 10 month olds. So the first study we did on this, we had eight infants um, in the sample. I'm gonna talk about that study and also um, uh, more data, um, new images that we have analyzed. And what we did here was we, I wanted to find some context which we, across which we could aggregate information. So we chose meal times very broadly defined because babies eat five times a day, and we called mealtime any context in which anybody was eating. The dog is eating, mealtime, okay? Mom is eating, mealtime. Ice cream in the park, mealtime. Cheerios on the floor, mealtime, okay? All right, but just so that we would likely have spoons, cups, things to aggregate over statistically, okay? And what we do here, I won't go into the details, but I can tell anybody who wants to, we take head camera images, 
We have five people tell us what's in them, do various kinds of reliability checks. They're trained to name things by common basic level nouns, okay? And that's how we find out what's in the images. And the first thing you should know is the world is um, just like everybody says it is. Uh, for these babies, it is highly cluttered. Within any scene at any moment, there are lots and lots of objects. On average, by this coding, nine nameable basic object categories in each scene. But everything's not there equal. Some things are in many scenes. Every scene is cluttered with lots of things. But some things occur repeatedly across all these babies and all these meal times. So this is just proportion of frames. And as you can see, there's a very few objects that are very, very pervasive in these scenes. Number 30 up there might be the sippy cup, okay? And many, many objects, in the first study, the coders found, 500, found 745 unique basic level categories. Most of those objects show up in three, four scenes, right? They're just not there very often. But a few things are there very, very often. Those things that are pervasive are, have names that children learn prior to 16 months normatively, okay? They're normatively learned prior to 16 months. Cup, spoon, table. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, well, that's interesting, because if these objects are visually pervasive, that likely means they're also hearing the names a lot, right? People talk about what's around. Actually, that's not true. We coded the auditory. Uh, this is in the second study. We coded the auditory. And so now what I've got here, I've got raw frequency because it's the best way to see it. On the y-axis is the number of type occurrence. For the light grays, that is the um, frequency of the words. And for the red is the frequency of the objects. And these are ordered, each of these types are ordered by the rank order of the object categories. Now, I can't show you the top of the the most frequent, pervasive frequency of objects, because that's about three floors up. We're at 200 to tokens here, and the top one has 7,245 actual raw frequency in this image. And that's because nobody's talking about these objects. Nobody's talking about the most pervasive objects. Nobody's talking about the rare objects. And everybody, when I tell them this result, they're like, but parents talk about things that are in view. The data changes as the baby develops. These are eight to 11 month old babies. They are not talking. When you listen to the recordings of these meal times, they sound like just what you hear in real homes. Parents are not talking all the time. And when they're talking to the baby, they're saying things like, hi, sweetie. Would you like another bite? They are not naming objects like people do for 12 to 13 month olds, okay? These babies aren't talking. They got sweet coos and nothing with an occasional spoon, occasional cup mentioned, okay? And when you look at, this is now we put them on the same scale. So when you put proportion of types, you can also see that they're not correlated. Parents are not particularly talking about the pervasive objects across these meal times. If I were doing a modeling talk, this is why I was, did the statistical to begin with. The pervasive visual input, visual of these objects, is enough for a statistical learner to learn these object names from what looks like almost random naming of the objects. That's because Every time the word is heard, the object's there. They're so pervasive, whereas nothing else, the word's heard, the object really there, okay? So for these over here, the statistical signal's very good because the visual pervasiveness clears it up, okay? Against those that are not. But I think that what visual pervasiveness is doing is probably more important for the visual system in that what visual pervasiveness of individual objects and categories from many different points of view may be critical to essential visual learning that a lot of people in cognition just jump over. You assume you're given the cup, 
okay? You can see it, a cup is a cup. But actually, the baby's got to learn to segment the objects, find them in scenes. They have to build strong visual memories of individual objects that they can aggregate over to learn object names. They have to determine what the image on the retina is about, which is a huge problem, okay? So the training that these babies are getting are very different from what people usually think. But we know that this training in babies, the very few faces they see, mom, dad, and grandma over the first year of life, mostly their sippy cup with an occasional coffee cup from mom and others, we know that by two years of age, this is enough to make them not just know these categories very well, but to become rapid, few-shot learners of any category. If they meet Uncle Harry for the first time, they only need to see him one weekend and they've got Uncle Harry's face for the rest of their lives, okay? If someone tells them what a tractor is, and they've, well, they have to come from the city, and they've never seen a tractor before, they would recognize tractors of all kinds from that one encounter. Your typical two, two and a half year old does this, okay? This comes from expertise about single things. This does not look at all what people think about visual category learning or what they think in computer vision is the best way to make a smart visual machine. Okay, the last thing um, I want to tell you about is that all this learning is self-generated by the learner's own behavior. And for those of you who are interested in issues of atypical development, and I hope maybe somebody will raise this in a question period or in the panel. There's a lot to say about this. When this baby is around some area on their journey through the world picking up data, ordered, structured, about a few things deeply, many things more rarely, what they learn depends on what they can do. If they can reach for objects and hold them and manipulate them, they get one kind of visual experience. Once they can run around and walk and go get anything that interests them and bring it close, they get other kinds of experiences. And the literature is telling us that these changes aren't just about motor abilities or running around and walking, okay? So for example, when babies begin to walk, Karen Adolph and Kathy Tamas Lamanda have evidence showing that people talk to them differently. Walking all of a sudden changes how smart you think your baby is and how autonomous they are, and people use much more complicated sentences so that the demonstration of autonomy is eliciting all kinds of different input. So I just want to say a little bit here before I conclude about how what babies can do in real time when they're picking up those little bits of data in fractions of a second um, influences learning, and what I'm going to um, talk about here, these are data from the multi-sensory project. These are where we bring babies in and their parents and wire them up and let them, where we resolution at very high degree motion and head sensors and um, head-mounted eye trackers on both participants as they play with objects in a highly constrained setting. And we have a lot of data on babies here from nine to 36 months, but I just want to concentrate on 18-month-olds so if this were the frequency of object names on the y-axis in, produ you know, in production from birth to 24 months, the period we're focusing on at 18 months is a period known as the, used to be known as the name explosion, when the number of words produced usually typically skyrockets in most children. This is also a period where hands, the babies and parents' hands, are just in every image, okay? These are the most manually oriented individuals, it's just hands, 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 on objects, okay? So let's see if this video plays. Yep, okay. So this is a baby, his personal view, from a head-mounted eye tracker, you can see the gaze things. This is the parent's view of the same activity from the opposite side, okay? So that's what our data looks like. Just so you get a sense of it. The baby's view looks like it's closer. The cameras are absolutely identical. It's just that the action is closer to the baby's eyes than it is to the parent's eyes because they have short hands because the parents are giving them the objects to play with. Okay. 
So, but the cameras are actually identical. All right, so. All right. What you see over and over again in these studies is that the hands are, con baby's hand actions are controlling their visual input. So what I'm showing on the y-axis here is a percentage of the head camera image that a particular object is in view. It's really percentage of pixels, okay? So this is like what would be on the retina. So here we would have an image in which the percentage of blue pixels is quite large. Um, the percentage of green pixels would be tiny, okay? Each object has its own color. Um, and what you can see, this is an individual child's, the size of the three objects in play in their head camera image is a function of real time in seconds. And what you can see is that objects go in and out of view and get large and small, okay? Their visual experience is a big blue object close, is some other object close, okay? Objects go in and out of view. We also know that um, Parents are actually very likely to name objects at moments when the, objects are, when the object being named is visually bigger for the child, more visually dominant in the image on the head camera and on the retina, more visually dominant on the image for the child. So one of the things we did was ask whether this was an opportune time for object name learning. So what we did in this, these, we did two different studies. <coughs> Slightly different method, but replicated the same phenomenon. We gave uh, parents and children novel objects to play with, with novel names. Parents were taught the novel names before the experiment. They were not told that children were going to be tested on these object names at the end. They were asked if they used names to use our names. They play six minutes, and then at the end, we uh, tested the child um, in a three alternative force choice task. And the question we wanted to know was, for any object names that this 18-month-old child manages to learn at the end, what, did, what were the visual experiences of that object name, okay? and what mattered to those visual experiences. Now, this is a tricky thing to do. Kids are tested in a three alternative force choice. So at the end, across the six objects they played with, we decided that individual object names were either learned or not learned. They were tested twice on each name. We took two out of two correct as saying they had learned those object names. And those of you who are statistically skilled says that does not even reach the 0.05 individual level. You're absolutely correct. There's some error and our classification of object names is learned or not learned. But once we classified an object name as learned, we then took all the naming events that were associated with that object name with that, and for that child, and we examined its visual properties. What were the visual properties for the naming events associated with ones we said the baby had learned, and ones we said the baby had not learned. There's also some noise in there because maybe a parent named an object five times. Four of them might have been not ideal namings from which the baby learned anything. One of them may have been a great naming moment that's controlling it, but we're lumping them all together, okay? This is all noise. The question is whether we can find the signal within the noise. And as you must be aware, I wouldn't be telling you if we couldn't. All right, so on the right, I wouldn't bother. On the y-axis are visual properties. On the x-axis is time. That blurry thing in the middle says utterance. And what we're going to do is we're going to take time. That's when the naming event happened. They're about one second long because we take the whole phrase. It's a modi. And we're going to look for 10 seconds, continuous time prior to that naming event, and 10 seconds afterwards. So we're doing 20 minutes around this, um, this event. All right, so here are learned object names, not learned object names. The blue line are the visual properties for the target. The red line is the visual properties for the competitors. 
what you can see is the learned object, when they learned an object name, that object was bigger in the child's view than competitors, and that difference lasted about five seconds. When the object name was not learned, slight difference, but not as big and not as long-lasting. For object names that were learned, they also tended to be centered in the child's view, that is not off to the side, but with the nose pointed at the object, which might be a good signal to the parent, and that that lasted for a long, longer time for learned object names relative to competitors than for unlearned object names, all right? Basically, and toddlers create these images of big objects centered in the view, good moments for parents to name them through their hands, okay? And I really want to, I only have a few minutes left here, but I really want to make the point that this is really about the baby's body in real time. And it's not about a three-month-old body. It's not about a six-month-old body. It's not about an 18-year-old body. This is about an 18-month-old body, okay? An 18-month-old body at the stage at which they rapidly learn object names. The factors about the body that go along with these events here are a stable head. You're more likely to learn an object name. You keep that image big and centered if you're not wiggling around and moving your head, okay? You're more likely to learn that object name if you are holding the object than if it's on the table or than if your parent is holding it. So even though parents sometimes create good views that are big, they are not as effective. Why aren't they as effective? because the baby doesn't hold their head still and it doesn't last as long, okay? And they're more likely to learn the object name when head and eyes are aligned when they look at it, okay? There are a lot of other things to tell you about 18-month-olds and how they generate object views. When they're holding objects, they rotate them, they show themselves different views of them. The properties of the views they show themselves actually predict both vocabulary development and they're learning the object names in that setting. The more they manipulate an object and the more different visual views they show of an object, the more likely they are in that moment to learn the object name. All right, and it, okay, yes. So, to come to the end here, um, in summary, the point I wanted to make is that development is a journey and it's like every single journey. It's one step at a time. And each step you take depends on where you just were, right? Doesn't, you don't jump around, you can't be beamed up from one locale to another, right? It's a step in time. You're always coming from where you just were. And the quality of each individual step matters. That's why the real time matters, because it determines what happens next, okay? and creates the path and aggregate. All this fact, the fact that it's a movement through space and time, with both time and space is continuous and depending upon the learner's own movement, gets us all the properties that I talked about. The learning environment will develop as the learner develops, as each of those individual steps changes. Okay. It will be highly selective in space and time. The learner can only learn. The data relevant for learning is only where they are at that moment, okay? And it'll be self-generated by the learner's behavior. I personally think, and maybe we'll have a chance to discuss later, that this has enormous consequences for thinking about machine learning and for thinking perhaps even more importantly for what we do to help individual children get on the right path, okay? So thank you very much, and with that, I'll put my collaborators all up. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, we have time for one or maybe two brief questions. Anybody up for that? Hands in the air. You might be wondering why I'm holding suddenly a blue package of some kind. So I'll just tell you what this is. This is a catch box. A catch box is a microphone hidden in a sort of a, a foam box. So when you want to ask something, I will throw this to you. It won't hurt you. It's pretty, pretty soft. Uh, and then when you want to talk in it, you raise it up to your chin and you talk like this. <laughs> it really works. 
Trust me, anybody wants to try it, okay? Then I will ask a question that is unfortunately not so brief, but I'm hoping that you could give at least some comment on it. It might be slightly off topic since I know that object learning is very much in focus for your, uh, for your research, but I got so curious about the faces specifically. Since faces are really, of course, not objects like any objects. We learn so much from faces that it's not just that this is a face. Um, do, how much do we know about the effect of what that specific face does, considering what your research is showing that a very small child sees faces a large amount of the time and the same faces or even the same face a major part of that time. So if we compare, for example, a mother who is very lively, very verbal with the kid to a mother who is, let's just say, depressed and a lot of time has a blank face, how much do we know about the effect of this on the development of the child? So I don't know about, um, there are people who are looking at uh, individual differences in, um, typical and atypical parents, let's say, I don't know how to use that phrase right, okay. But they are mostly laboratory experiments where they bring them in for an hour and they are making inferences from there. And they may be perfectly valid inferences. I do know that in the data set that we've collected in the US and in the data set that we collected in this rural village in India, which, um, again, there's no electricity, so most, except what's stolen, <laughs> um, so most, most of life occurs outside the house, okay? So it's a very different visual context in many ways. Um, that faces tend to be in view in that early, up to four months period, let's say, for very long periods of time, those faces are close. They are, um, uh, show both eyes. They're within two feet when I say close. They're within two feet of the baby, typically. And they're dynamic. These are people talking to the baby as they change them or feed them or just saying sweet things to the baby, right? They are dynamic. They include sounds. We know from um, Daphne Maurer's work that if babies have cataracts that are removed by even as late as four months, that not having those which are probably strongly constrained, evolutionary constrained experiences on the part of both the parents and on the part of what babies like to look at, um, that there are permanent damages to the uh, components of the visual system. Babies who don't have those experiences at three months, up, up in the first four months, end up, um, they can recognize faces, they don't have proper, proper pagnosia as the thing goes, but they actually never develop what's considered the signature of human face processing, which is configural face perception which normally emerges about five, but when you follow them throughout life, they don't get configural face processing. They also show deficiencies in um, auditory visual synchrony judgments, even with quite arbitrary stimuli um, later in life. And the best guess is the tuning for the audio visual synchrony probably comes from, you know, the, the, the faces and the uh, lip and movement motions, visual motions with the sound changes. Um, so there's this idea that they're really tuning things, I think is, is probably true. And so the question, of course, is how much distortion could you take? And I don't have the answer to that, okay. Very interesting though. Thank you so much. Thanks to Professor Linda Smith.